most people who get sued are not nurses. It's usually high risk surgeons. So mm. orthopedic surgeons, surgeons who are doing spinal surgeries, um, a lot of delayed diagnosis when it comes to breast cancer. The work that we do every day doesn't necessarily lead to harm, but there are some people who have habits that are easily documented that show um, that they are just negligent overall. Ooh, I gotta go. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid on my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan they can't eat. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show with your host, Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world, one conversation at a time. So let's jump right into it. If you find a value on the show and want to join us on this mission, please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for the latest merch, updates, and all your information about us. For our lifestyle brand, you can check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, we would like to introduce you to Ernice Williams. Ernice is an experienced nurse and now attorney. She has a vast amount of knowledge when it comes to healthcare law. Ernice has advocated for and trained thousands of healthcare professionals to work within their scope of practice. She has also worked with over 100 businesses, helping them operate and stay protected by creating systems, solutions, and success through her five-step framework. Hey, Ernest, welcome to the show. Can you give us a brief background about yourself and your experience? Yeah, so I've been a nurse for 14 years. I started my career, oh my goodness, in 2007, uh, before the last Great Recession. Um, but I landed my dream job working at Hopkins. I started the OR, but I knew like, ooh, this isn't where I want to stay forever. A lot of my friends were going to CRNA school or MP school, but I knew that wasn't for me. Um, and so I started kind of exploring what other options were out there, whether it was a law degree or I really wanted to get a public health degree because I really like public health work, but I didn't really see jobs that were paying for that type of work. And so I moved from Baltimore back to DC and really kind of got immersed into the world of politics because that's all people in DC talk about and um, decided that I was going to go to law school to combine my healthcare experience and then get this new legal experience and bring some clarity to both the legal mm. side where people are creating laws for nurses and for healthcare providers and patients that nobody else understands and the impact is so great um, and then to providers and healthcare cl and clinicians to understand like how the process works because we are simply just getting the rules kind of thrown down the pipeline and we have to just make it work so um, I went to law school graduated had a hard time finding a job mm -hmm. people don't really see the value of nurses they only see nurses as caregivers and caretakers of people like the phys in the physical sense they don't think about the mental work that we do right the education the conversation the communication um just thinking ahead they just assume like oh the only thing you can do is physically mm -hmm. take care of someone and so when i tried to discuss like no my transferable skills are this people weren't very um kind and taking that as um, an option. So I had a hard time finding a job. So mm -hmm. I ended up staying in nursing up until last year. I did a lot of different jobs like hospice. I was a manager. I worked on a telemetry unit. And then I decided I had started a law firm in 2017, but I didn't do it full time because I didn't really love it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work for someone else because right, a paycheck is easier than being an entrepreneur. But then nothing was really coming together. And of course, the pandemic shook up me just like it shook up a lot of people and I decided to kind of just go for it like if I'm going to do it I'm going to go all in if it doesn't work mm -hmm. it doesn't work and it's worked so I now run my own law firm where I work with healthcare providers who are now opening up businesses whether it's post-op or IV hydration um, doing compliance for big healthcare tech companies who are moving into new spaces as well um, and you know just making the most mm -hmm. of my experiences um, uh, for both patients and providers. Okay. I have a question about law school. When you go to go to law school, do you have to select like for example a, a specialty of a law to go into or is just or just like like a broad law degree and then you kind of figure it out from there? How does that work? 
Yeah, some schools have the option where you can kind of not specialize, but like get an additional like certificate. Um, but most law schools just have like everyone has a general program. It is three years. You can take some additional courses. So they did have some health law courses that I took, um, but it didn't allow me to be like a health law lawyer. You don't graduate with a specialized degree. Everyone gets a juris doctorate um, in this general you know, area of law. And then you really get the experience on the job. Okay. Did you have a specific event in your nursing career that really pushed you and made you passionate about law? Yeah, so I had a patient um, who was very young, well-educated. He had his PhD, he was a principal, and he had lost his job, so he lost his health insurance. And in between that time, he found out that he was a diabetic. He had no health insurance, and this was pre-ACA, um, so that he really didn't have any options. So he went to the free clinic. He said they treated him so bad. They were so disrespectful. They thought he was like homeless and uneducated, and they just communicated with him in a way that was degrading for him. So he never went back. He got like a little nick on his knee. And because his diabetes was out of control, he ended up getting an amputation mm -hmm. at a very young age. And he was still very optimistic. Um, I met him pre-surgery. I was working the pre-op PACU and he was going to surgery and he was like, you know, I get it. It's my responsibility. It's my fault. I should have went back. But that experience pushed me away from ever going to seek care mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be treated that way. And I was like, that's crazy, mm. right? Because, he, and he now, like, and the, at that time he had gotten another job. He was the principal of another school. It was literally that lapse of insurance that caused him to have an amputation because he had a bad experience in healthcare. And so it got my mind going and like my energy to say, like, if this is happening to him, someone who is educated, who understands the basics of healthcare, what's happening to someone who's marginalized, who is um, has issues with literacy, um, women who essentially are having multiple children and people are judging you based on your own experiences. So that was kind of the trigger for me to say like, let me put this application in, see if I get in. I took the LSAT, I didn't do really well. I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get in. And I ended up getting into a couple of schools. I went to Howard for undergrad and I ended up going back to Howard for law school. Um, and I, I'm sure I got in just because I was different because I was a nurse because it wasn't my score. Yeah, but that's super cool. Hey, you, you got it done. You know, you you fit in the program and you took care of business. And now now you now you do law. Yeah. How was that transition yeah. from being a nurse to being a, a lawyer and now owning your own law firm? Because that's that's like a giant shift. Because as nurses, you're doing mm -hmm. hands on patient care. You're seeking orders from doctors. To now, you're in law school, learning about the law where it's not as, as hands-on, it's more verbal and more of trying to figure out people's problems, but in like a more of a verbal sense than a, than, a, than a physical sense. How is that transition mm -hmm. for you? Yes, um, it's been really difficult. I think that you can mask so much when you're taking care of a patient, right? So if I'm having a bad day, if something bad is happening in my life, I can put that to the side to care for my patient and that patient's issues now kind of allows me to just push my problems to the side. When you work for yourself, all of the things that you've never taken care of, like your mental health because you've been too busy because you were working at the bedside, it all comes up, right? So in the sense of like, it's not just the work, it's also like the internal work that I've had to do to say, wow, I really do have some issues with my confidence, right? You can be confident in your skills because you can actually see like, I'm good at this, I'm good at that. And the things that I'm, I'm not good at, I have someone on the floor who can help me with the IVs or someone on the floor who can help me with the Foley or something like that. Versus now everything is on me. You, I cannot not be good at marketing. I cannot not be good at, you know, communicating with patients. I have to be good at sales. I have to be good at, you know, doing the actual work. I have to be good at leading a team. You can't not be good. You have to be great and you have to do it with integrity because your name carries so much weight, right? Um, like I sold some, like a digital product to someone and they didn't like it. And I'm like, okay, I'll just refund your money back. Before I could, re it was like $20 or maybe $15. I'm like, I'll refund your money back. No problem. Before I could even refund their money back, they went on Instagram and was like slandering me, mm, wow. right? And so I'm like, I'm the money was already refunded. I already apologized. I kind of explained to them my thought process. And I'm like, but they were like, she's a fraud and she's this and she, right? And so you are now the front facing, right? People in 
do things and like can verbally attack you at work. And it's like you, unless it really goes too far, most of the time you're gonna like, okay, whatever, it's not that big of a deal. I can understand you have dementia, you have this or whatever. But when it comes to those type of business relationships, it can, you take it personal because it's you, I am the work, <laughs> I do the work. And so um, the transition I think is not necessarily just the work and the way that I have to think because we as nurses are critical thinkers. We understand how to work through problems. It's just done in a different way, right? You now are working through problems with the team, with orders and like a plan of care. The same thing is applied to the work I do as a lawyer, but now it also comes with all of these other responsibilities like taxes and payroll <laughs> and building a team and making sure that I'm actually bringing in money to the practice to make sure that everybody gets paid. So uh, the transition was definitely hard. Um, when I first started, I, I've always always had anxiety um but I said like I said when I'm at work it's very easy for me to kind of ease that because I can just take care of my patients when I started working for myself my anxiety got so bad that like I had to get into therapy to remind myself that the whole world isn't going to come crumbling down every single month and that like tomorrow is a new day and things do get better um and so you can't really be an entrepreneur and not deal with your personal problems like I think we do um, as nurses Thank you for being so art articulate and vulnerable. That's so powerful. You mentioned that you might gain confidence in one career with everything you did as skill set, and then you go into a different career, mm -hmm. and whatever you had as far as like self esteem or confidence just got shut down, and you're like rebuilding yourself mm -hmm. as a person in your new career, or your yeah. new jersey, uh, new journey. So, kind of going back to the nursing career, what are some things that we have to look out for as nurses that we should be careful working in a healthcare field that we could get in trouble for where law yeah. will get involved. I know we talk sometimes as nurses, oh, you have to go to court or chart, be very meticulous with charting. But what does that actually mm -hmm. look like when you can't get in trouble and be taken to court? Yeah, so I always tell people, you know, this fear of like going to court or being in a deposition is something like is like passed on like a generational curse, right? People are like, this happened to someone that I know. And then all of a sudden, it kind of just is like a whisper that people are kind of discussing. Um, when you look at the percentage of nurses that have actually been deposed or actually brought into court or criminalized for some of their actions, the percentage is like, one to two percent mm. out of the millions of nurses so it may be a few thousand but over the years that's not a lot compared to how many nurses are actually in practice the bigger issue which is never really addressed by healthcare organizations is like our poor documentation leads to poor communication which leads to poor outcomes which leads to people not getting paid right and so what i tell people is like our concern about our practice leading to a legal issue is actually not as big as our practice leading to just a poor outcome. And then because that person probably wasn't doing well, it kind of gets swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. So when I tell people, when you think about your practice as a, a nurse, you think about your documentation, you're thinking about communication. You don't want to overly communicate because then that could lead to people digging further and finding issues. You don't want to under communicate because then that can lead to someone missing an issue and a problem. So it's just a fine balance of understanding your power as a practitioner and what you need to communicate and then what you need to lead to the other team members for them to communicate right i think sometimes we take into our um in, into our control everything that everyone else is doing the pharmacy didn't do this and the physician didn't do that and we put that into our documentation that is not our role our role is to communicate what we did what we are before supposed to do and that's that it'll be very clear if the provider, if the pharmacy, um, if the radiologist didn't do their job because the, that gap will be there for someone else to see. You don't want to show someone that there is a gap, but you just wanna be able to document to show what you did. Um, and that's kind of how I teach people documentation is focus on your role, your practice, and allow everybody else to kind of focus on theirs. So what can nurses actually get in trouble for? I, I know that if you, for example, give an extra unit of insulin or two units, you're not gonna go to court for that. You're not gonna get in trouble for that. If you actually mm -hmm. hold medication, you're not gonna get in trouble for that and go to court for that. So what are some things that nurses are actually liable for? And you said that position. What is, what is a deposition as well? And what kind of yeah. things could, could cause a nurse to, to need a deposition? Yeah, so a deposition is essentially where 
um, a, lawyer, a family member has been harmed or maybe has passed away and they have hired a lawyer, that lawyer sends a letter of intent to the organization like, don't throw away anything. We potentially could be suing you. Um, depending on what state you're in, you could go to what's called arbitration, which is like just a conversation back and forth and you kind of get to see the evidence, but it's not a formal process. Um, some states require that because lawsuits go back and forth and they could take a long time or sometimes you can just um, directly sue and then of course you get a trial date and then people show up and things like that so before they go to trial there's a deposition which means that the other attorney for the family um, they're essentially going to come and say to ask you a set of questions it can't be just any question they have to submit those questions ahead of time it's a limited amount of questions but usually they're going to ask questions based on your documentation so they're going to say did you document this did you document that what happened before this what happened before that and it's going to be based on the information that they have they can't ask you things that they don't know right so if you go in there and you say well this is what I did, but actually this person should have done that. You've now given additional information mm -hmm. that they didn't know and they can take that and, and use that against the organization or the whoever they're suing, right? Many hospitals have policies where they try to get the nurses or the providers out um, because they want to kind of, of course, protect their their staff. Like if you get sued, you could potentially lose your license and all those kind of things. So that's not their goal. Their goal isn't to throw people under the bus. What usually happens, right, for nurses is that we make glaring errors and we don't follow the process in communicating those errors. For example, I made a medication error as a travel nurse on my first or second day during the pandemic. Um, we couldn't take the machines into the room. Medications were coming up crazy. So I had a whole bunch of medications on my wow cow, right? And so I looked, I sorted out the medications, but when I went to pick up the medication, uh, the antibiotic, I walked into the room, it looked the same as the other one, hung it, and as it fin finished, um, I realized I had given the wrong antibiotics to the wrong patient. I come out the room, I'm sweating profusely, I'm panicking like, yo, this is crazy, this is an elderly patient, like, what if she has a reaction? I check her chart, she's not allergic to anything. I talk to the doctor, I text him, I let him know, like, I'm so sorry, this happened, I'm gonna document it. I go to the manager and I'm like, hey, I made an error, I need to put this into the system. And she looked at me like, do what? And I was like, no. I'm going to put this into the system because she may not have a reaction now, but if she has a reaction later, I wanted to show that we did everything that, I, that we were supposed to do, right? I communicated with the doctor. I kept an eye on the patient. I did, you know, all of those things. The issue usually comes when people make mistakes that either lead to, um, and they don't follow the process, mm -hmm. right? They don't understand what the policy is, or it does lead to harm. So there is some sort of negligence, right? There was negligence on my part, right? I could have lost my license for that, but because it was like a low risk thing, it wasn't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But imagine me giving that patient a medication that made her heart stop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That That's what, so, when we what i tell nurses when their fears and their stress it's like you have to create a system that works for you i tell people if i'm giving medication don't talk to me i don't want to hear your story i don't care about your baby daddy like i i just want to give my med like if i'm in the medication room i need to focus if i'm giving insulin i need to focus right this isn't the time to come and joke and laugh and play now if i'm charting okay we can he he ca ca that's fine but if i'm doing something that's important let me focus on the task and so i think some of the issues is that people get very comfortable with being very relaxed and not having a system in place, right? I worked on a telemetry floor before I gave a any type of blood pressure medication. I checked some, you know, the, the blood pressure, but there were some people who never checked the blood pressure. They would just look at the last one at midnight and if it was fine, they would give the 7 a.m. meds. Mm. That you, one, our policy was to check the blood pressure, but two, it just makes sense as a nurse yeah. to think critically about what you're doing. And so that's, usually what happens, right? The most most people who get sued are not nurses, it's usually high risk surgeons, so mm. orthopedic surgeons, surgeons who are doing spinal surgeries, um, a lot of delayed diagnosis when it comes to breast cancer. The work that we do every day doesn't necessarily lead to harm, but there are some people who have habits that are easily documented that show um, that they are just negligent overall and they are not actually safe to um, see patients. And that's what the board is for. People think the board is out to get, get you. And I'm telling people like, the board, if you've ever been to the physical building, many people have it, I have just because 
my board is slow and I'm like, I need y'all to like approve my license so I can work. So I usually just go up there. It's a small office and, and whatever building that they may be in, it's not a lot of people. They're not hundreds of people working in that office. So they're not out here trying to get thousands of nurses. They don't even have the capacity to do so, but they are here to protect the public and that's their job. So they have to investigate things where pe that people submit to them. And of course, if they find that something could potentially have caused harm, they may have to pull you up and ask those questions. And so I think that's people's fear. People are like always afraid of making a mistake. But honestly, most of us work with extreme amounts of integrity. Um, most of us have our own systems where, you know, some people, especially in the ICU, they have like their papers and they are very meticulous about how they work, which usually helps us catch errors more than actually, you know, create them. Mm. One thing that stood out for me there is you mentioned where you don't shame other healthcare providers. So when it comes to charting and documentation, be subjective only for yourself. If something happened, if something that patient said, put that in quotations, don't use subjective information on phlebotomy or pharmacy, because like you said, the system will catch that. There's no need to give out extra mm -hmm. information. And you mentioned some mm -hmm. examples about negligence. And what is the difference between negligence and malpractice? Yeah. So in health, like negligence is kind of like the general term of neglecting someone or essentially not meeting the standard of care. Um, the way in which we measure it in malpractice, right, where you essentially um, have not kept your oath or, or, or not met the licensure requirements of the job that you have is based on what they, what I'm saying is the standard of care. So in this typical sense of like negligence, it would be like, depending what the crime is, because this is not a crime, this is a civil issue. They created a different standard, which is called the standard of care. Mm -hmm. So based on whatever, if you work in like med surge, they're going to say, what are the med surge standards of care for diabetes for someone who's receiving insulin. And that is not going to be based on just your hospital po hospital's policy. It's going to be based on the national standard, which is why I tell people y'all have to stay plugged in and educated to these conferences and to these associations where they're updating and trying to get people to practice evidence-based practice because that is what will save you every single time. It's not going to be, this is how I do it every single time. Because if you're doing it wrong, they're going to be like, well, that doesn't make sense because the standard of care says that you should be doing it this way. So that's kind of what people need to understand is like, what is the standard of care? How does it compare to your hospital policy? Do you need to speak with your organization to update your own standards of care so that y'all are actually using evidence-based practice? Because that's the, when they call in the experts, they're going to call in experts who are going to speak to the national um, standards of practice. Mm -hmm. So now I want to kind of switch up a little bit. How does HIPAA play into all of this, especially with like social mm -hmm. media and the nurses get in trouble for HIPAA? Because we, we all know how important health information uh, and, and privacy of that information is. But I haven't really met a nurse in my what, in our five year nursing career that has ever been taken to court or has ever gotten in trouble for for, for, for HIPAA. So how does that work with, with the whole law and how can you protect yourself just, just to make sure that that one time isn't isn't going to be you getting into for HIPAA and the whole social media aspect of yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, that is major. So I, when I first started my career, I worked at a hospital, or maybe I was training at the hospital, and there was a nurse who worked in um, mother baby, and she had befriended the mom. They had became really close, and the mom allowed her to post a photo on her Instagram. Mm -hmm. So the hospital somehow found out, and the hospital's policy said you cannot post a patient without a patient physically or the patient's guardian signing a form from the hospital. Because even though she gave verbal consent, she could always rescind that consent or say, I never said that, mm. right? So now you've put the hospital at risk. That was like the story where I was like, wow, like this is serious. I always tell people your phone, I text of course, but like FaceTiming, taking pictures on the unit, especially in patient care areas, that's a no-no. Like, I'm not sure why people consistently do it, um, but it happens and it's a violation of HIPAA. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes HIPAA issues don't get to the main 
you know, like mainstream media because they're usually handled internally because they don't want to deal with the, um, the backlash. So they'll fire people. They definitely will um, reprimand. Usually they will just fire you. They're not even really going to give you an opportunity to fix it. Um, like I think during the pandemic, I remember someone was taking like a selfie and behind them were like some patient documents or maybe it was like a computer screen. HIPAA violation, they were fired. Um, at, at I used to work for Federally Hot Qualified Healthcare Center, and one of the things that would happen, like someone sitting at the front desk and they're FaceTiming, um, and or they take a picture and they post it, and then someone somehow like goes, you know, people are ridiculous, goes in and they're able to see someone's social security number or their address and they steal their identity. Um, and so I think there was recently someone who had an, um, who filmed a patient who was an LND either actively in labor or just had a baby um, and posted it on Snapchat. Of course, the patient didn't find it, but the hospital ended up finding it. And not only did they fire her, but they also charged her with a crime mm -hmm. uh, because of privacy laws. And so she, she's definitely going to lose her license or uh, for a period of time. She also may end up going to jail. So um, I tell people that like, Protected health information in HIPAA is what we know, but data privacy and privacy overall is something that is increasingly growing as a, an issue, uh, especially in states like California. They have very strict privacy laws when it comes to respecting people's protected health information. Um, and that's whether you're a healthcare provider or a business owner or, or anything. And so if you have access to someone's photos, someone's name, date of birth, address, anything that could potentially identify them, that could be a potential violation of HIPAA. There are tons of HIPAA violations, usually by large organizations, through data breaches where someone has either received a phishing email, they've clicked it, and that has exposed mm -hmm. the data that is within their system. Um, we've seen a, a one time I recently saw where a health insurance company sent out a mailer where it was folded just a little bit wrong so that in the window portion it showed that basically that person had HIV mm. and so it was the letter was sent out to all of their HIV patients like as an update huge HIPAA violation that they kind of ended up facing so there are a lot of examples of it I think that people are like need to understand the balance of educating in real time. I tell stories, but like you don't know where I worked at when I when I told that story. Mm -hmm. You don't know, you know, when I worked there. It's very hard to identify, even if you know a family member who may have been in the hospital who had something similar, you can't really pinpoint it. So I tell people when you're telling stories on social media to educate or inform the public, you need to be as very general as possible. Mm -hmm. You can't like I I see a lot of people who come out of the hospital like I just had a really hard day. I just had a patient who went through X, Y, and Z, and I'm just like, really? Mm. To like the literally the moment you walk out of the hospital, you're now telling a story about something in real time. I don't think that is necessarily appropriate when you're speaking specifically to that patient's experience. If you're speaking to your own experience and saying I had a bad day, things are really tough for me. Okay, but you're saying I had a bad day, and this is the specific type of patient that I saw. Mm. That's that's you know that could potentially see, be seen as a HIPAA violation. So I just tell people just to err on the side of caution. Um, don't post photos while you are in patient care areas, um, just to kind of avoid that, um, and to be conscious of the type of content that you're posting that could potentially be identified. Mm -hmm. So very, we actually had somebody. We, so we have something called a debrief, and what mm -hmm. we like to do is we like to share stories about our experience in the workplace. But we try to be very, very careful where, just like you mentioned, mm -hmm. no one knows the hospital we work at, age, all that HIPAA stuff is removed. And we actually talk to a lawyer before to see if this is appropriate because how far can you push that pendulum mm -hmm. of where it's appropriate or not? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. question is, is it okay to share nursing stories? And how far? Yeah. You're just mentioning very subjective to your experience, but not necessarily... Yeah pinpointing people at like a location or maybe what um, diagnosis they have, like where, where is the, mm -hmm. the HIPAA there? Yeah, how far can we go? Yeah, so I tell people as long as someone can't identify that person, right? And so, you know, I try to tell stories that do include like, okay, you may know that there was a male, but you don't know what floor I was on. Like, especially when I was a travel nurse, like I worked on every single floor of the hospital. Um, and so it was like, you wouldn't have known where I worked even if I, I did share that that much information. But it's like, usually when you're telling stories that are like 
far removed from time. So like not in this moment, like a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, I feel like you can give more context, not details, but context because it's far removed and nobody's really gonna be able to identify that. When you're telling stories in closer proximity to when they happened, you do wanna be a little bit more careful about the details that you share just because you never know who's watching. Like if you're, your content shows up in front of the, those people's family, they may be able to identify who you're talking about mm -hmm. and then be able to say, hey, this is my family member. I don't feel that, like that's appropriate. So, um, you know, there's no like clear definition like yes, sharing nursing stories, patient stories and experiences, it is extremely important to keep the um, public grounded in what is actually happening to us and what could potentially happen to them very important. The fine balance is making sure that we're not pinpointing details that could potentially be identified, whether it is, you know, though like the diagnosis, like you were saying, sometimes people use room numbers or the floor that they were working on or the date that it happened. Like we want to remove those specific details and tell like a general um, experience that doesn't pinpoint where it actually happened. Mm -hmm. I want to flip the tables a little bit. We talked a lot about nurses going to court or uh, yeah. them getting sued. So have you ever ran into a case where maybe a healthcare provider, a physician or a nurse or anybody that works in hospital has gone after and sued the hospital for something that they did wrong or didn't, um, didn't set them up for success, maybe set them, set them up for failure? Because we always hear nurses getting sued, surgeons getting sued, physicians getting sued, but we don't necessarily ever hear of like a healthcare professional suing a hospital. We hear of people suing hospitals, but has a healthcare mm -hmm. provider ever sued a hospital? And what would, what would kind of start that process? Why would you uh, have to go after your, your uh, place of work? Yeah, I mean, there are a myriad of issues, a lot of times usually with employment law, um, discrimination. So sometimes people may have an injury or they may have a documented disability. Um, and if they're not following the ADA or if they are not following their own HR processes and protocols or employment laws within their state, a lot of times people will come back and sue. People will usually sue for wrongful termination. So they've essentially said that there was no reason for me to be fired. Um, I was just simply speaking up or, or, or you know, trying to um, advocate for my patients. I've seen a lot of that as well. Um, I worked at a hospital when I was like in a union where nurses were fired because they didn't come to work during a snowstorm. So one nurse was was sick from an E. coli exposure that she had at work from a salad bar. Like I do not do salad bars in hospitals <laughs> because of that. It was like, it like wiped out half the hospital. It was oh, really, really God. bad, but it was like right before a snowstorm. So she was home with um, GI upset because of that E. coli exposure. Another nurse, had an accident on the way into work um, and she like spun out. She ended up still coming in, but the next day, of course, she felt bad, so she stayed home. So they fired her and like a few other nurses related to that. They all, they didn't end up suing. They ended up going through the, the union process, but if they didn't get their jobs back, they were gonna sue. Um, and they ended up getting their jobs back and back pay and all of those things. But um, I see a lot of people who get wrongful termination. Um, it is hard to prove wrongful termination, especially when you work in an at-will state, which I think 47 or 48 states are at will states, which means like they can fire you for any reason, but you can also quit for any reason, right? Mm -hmm. You're not obligated to stay there. Um, and so I think that that is a little bit of an issue. It's hard to prove. And so what I teach people, documentation is everything. It doesn't also have to do with patient care. It also has to do with any issues that you're having. If you're having issues with your manager or with, uh, with leadership, you want to make sure you're documenting that through emails and not just having phone calls so that you have a paper trail to be able to bring those issues up because people will have those kind of conversations um, to you. But if it's verbal, it's going to be very, very difficult to prove. So... Um, I've seen, I mean, I like that experience was very traumatic because I'm like, they fired you for a snowstorm. I'm like, okay, I don't want to work for an organization that fires nurses for those types of things. But I think it happens a lot. But like I said, they try to settle it and keep it out of the media uh, because it can, of course, keep people from wanting to work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, there's some cases that we know, like in California, where the hospitals were not even on the news, but there's like a crazy event that happened. So it's just wild how that side of the spectrum works. So as far as like, mm -hmm. um, I hear nurses sometimes say, you should have malpractice insurance. Why don't you have it? I've thought about it before. I looked at different um, providers, but I never pulled the trigger on it. Do you personally recommend mm -hmm. nurses having malpractice insurance? 
Yeah, I always tell, so I feel like everyone has a different opinion. As a nurse who is a lawyer, I have my own opinion. I know other nurses who are lawyers who say you need to have it, it's important. Um, and so I say, listen to them, listen to what they're saying, and then you make a decision for yourself. I have never personally had it because for me, I have uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans. I got kids, I got a lot of stuff. So if you gonna come after me, you're gonna be behind all of those people. I understand how a state a state planning works. And so I'm not necessarily worried about someone trying to, like you, if you sue, I'm negative, I'm worth negative hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's nothing over here for you to get, right? And if I do ever get assets, I'll put it in a trust to make sure it's protected. So for me, I am not necessarily worried about that. I don't practice with that type of fear. Um, but for other people, I think that's something that, um, you know, that's a decision that they really have to make on their own based on their own practice and based on kind of how they move around. Okay. And Ernest, with your law firm, do you just help people during those challenges when when they have to go to court or are there this position or anything like that? Or do you also provide education? What else does your law firm do? Yeah, so um, since 2020, we've been providing a lot of educational courses. So I have a documentation course that really goes into depth on a lot of the things that we discussed here today. Um, I have a, it's like another documentation guide. So teaching people and some templates of like, okay, um, like a decision tree, like if this happens, it's what you should do. If this happens, it's what you should do, as well as some additional videos um, that are available specifically for nurses. Um, and then I also have for new business owners, if you're seeking to get into business, I have a business boot camp that's launching again in January. Um, so a lot of nurses are starting their own staffing agencies, are starting their own post-op care. I'm telling nurses it's time for us to double up and hustle up because the economy is crashing, but healthcare will remain. We There is gonna be a shift on where that money goes, but the money's gonna go somewhere. Patients have to be taken care of. So mm -hmm. to kind of just be alert. Um, and that's why I kind of do that boot camp. Um, and then I also help uh, businesses that are already established, essentially help either build, operate, protect their business through my healthcare business starter kit. I do some board defense work, light. I don't necessarily do a lot of litigation. I don't go to court, that's not my thing. But um, I usually, usually what I tell people, if they can catch the issue before it gets that far, I can usually help them kind of navigate that. So it depends. I kind of take things on a case by case basis, depending on how deep or how bad things are for them. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of, we do a run of the gamut um, thing kind of thing over here. So just a previous episode ago, we had somebody that we talked about with entrepreneurship. So when it comes to mm -hmm. nurses starting their own businesses, we don't yeah. understand law that well. What are some common issues that you see beginning nursepreneurs facing when it comes to legality? Yeah, so a lot of people can understand like they know how to establish the business. You go to the Secretary of State website, boom, you're done. They really don't understand like you are different because you don't just own a business, you also have a license, right? So if you're doing anything that's still related to healthcare, you have to protect the business and you have to make sure that you're in compliance to protect your license because the Department of Health can pull up on you about the business, but the board can pull up on you about your license and your scope of practice. So what I tell people is like, if you're looking to go into an industry and you're not very sure, you wanna understand what your scope of practice is, what the liabilities and the risks are, and then how can you mitigate and kind of decrease those things by having a compliance set of, set of compliance tools and resources in place. Because when they come with the questions, they're gonna give you two weeks to respond. And if you don't respond, then they're gonna move forward with their process. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people are getting into the, like, the medical aesthetics world. And it's like, oh, I took a class from this person who doesn't work in their state, who doesn't understand the law. And I'm telling them like, well, that's not really what's possible. And that's not what you should be doing. And of course now they They've already paid someone five thousand dollars and it's like wait well what do i do now um and so i tell people before you go spend a, a, a lot of money on courses or classes for things that you may not really understand at least meet with someone who's knowledgeable who can make sure that that's something that is applicable and you can actually do in your state um, and to kind of give you the framework and the questions to ask so that the educational portion that you invest in is actually worth your time mm -hmm. and you mentioned uh you mentioned travel agencies so man i've been traveling for a mm -hmm. while how does the law and the regulation work on their end? Can you touch base upon that? Like, what are they responsible for in providing the uh, the nurse or respiratory therapist or anybody that travels with them? Is there a, a specific set of guidelines where it's not? Because for me, it just seems like all they have to really do is pay me. 
pay me, offer me insurance, and that's basically all they're really there for. And give me a contract. What are yeah. what are they responsible for to set the nurse up for success, and so they don't get in trouble? Or even if the nurse does mess up at work, and now it's a court issue. Is a travel agency liable for something as well because they put that nurse in that contract? How does that all uh, get mm -hmm. pieced together? Yeah. So staffing agencies are a very difficult, like special group of people. I think that's the issue that there aren't like, they're not typical employers, right? So yes, you may be employed by them, but you also may have a contract with somebody else. So who's really responsible for you, right? Are, are they fully responsible for you or the other agency that you may be working for? But then are they also just responsible for the 13 weeks that you're working for them? Because now you've moved on to another contract with another agency. So they live in this very, um, there, there are some employment laws that apply to staff agencies about communication about pay about overtime when it comes to like if money is missing from your check like they have a certain time that they need to respond and to fix those kind of things but when it comes to actual accountability that is where there's a lack so in Pennsylvania I think last week they just passed um, a law where they're gonna have a lot more oversight specifically for um, staffing agencies because of that. Um, and I think on the federal level, they're going to do more investigations to see what is actually happening because everybody was flying by the seat of their pants through the pandemic. And so um, some of the issues I think that comes up is that many of these staffing agencies are in multiple different states. You may be a resident of one state, but you work in another state. And so then there's like a conflict of law. So what law really applies? Who really applies to this? And so I think that's really the issue. There's no one rule that says if a staffing agency who is started in Missouri, but they have a contract in Maryland, like what law actually applies? And then you may be a resident of California, but you're working a contract for them and like a crisis contract in Louisiana, like what is really happening here? Like how do we actually figure this all out? Um, understanding that it can just be really, really complicated. I don't think there's a specific um, set of guidelines which I think they're trying to change because of all of the things that happened through the pandemic. Mm, geez, that does sound like a cluster. Get yourself yeah. a good lawyer, Pete. Yeah, <laughs> I got one right in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I don't ever need to, need to call her for anything, but you know, if, if I do, I'm ready. Yeah. Ernest, where can people find you? Awesome. Yeah, so I'm on all social media platforms, Instagram, LinkedIn, and sometimes I'm on TikTok too. Uh, Twitter as Your Nurse Lawyer. You can find me at yournurselawyer.info online um, or erniswilliams.com. That essentially is my website. Um, and I love to chat and meet and connect with you all. There's so many resources out there. I have a YouTube channel with a ton of content for you all. So like, check it out. There's like so much out there and I want people to feel comfortable just going a little bit deeper and asking those good questions so that they can, you know, get what they need. Yes. And one last question I'd like to ask all of our guests. Yeah. So if you had an opportunity to have a cup of coffee one last time with anybody, who would it be and why? Hmm. I think I would have it with oh, I'm trying to think if it's like my like someone who's like alive or dead or like alive. Dead. Okay, dead or alive. Um, oh, that's really hard. Um, I think I would have it with like my grandfather because he, you know, I look at the generation that he came from where it was like coming out of like sharecropping and coming out of like the South to move up North and to create this life. And I feel like, you know, he created something out of nothing that was huge and a foundation for my family. Like I didn't, I never knew of a will, but he had a will and he had all of these things in place. And I kind of really wish I would have learned more about the things that he did to prepare his family for the future. Um, because I feel like it was lost in the generation after him, right? Like my parents and my aunts and stuff haven't done it or they definitely don't discuss it. And so I would love to have a cup of coffee with him and really get into his mindset, his head of how he strategically built his life to make sure that we had a better life. Awesome. That's powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, bye.